Uh, we have now an exciting presentation by uh, Uros Djurkovic. Uh, he's a doctoral student, uh, Faculty of Philology, University of Belgrade, uh, Institute of Serbian Cultural Culture Pristina, Leposavic. Okay, so the title of the project or, uh, that, that uh, Urush is presenting for us is a step towards a new paradigm. Biophilia Bjork in the light of the performing arts. That sounds really, really interesting. So <laughs> Urush, camera is yours and uh, I think we're all ears. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, hello everyone. I'm, as, as it's previously said, I'm Moros Jurkovic, a PhD candidate in literature here in Belgrade. And currently I'm working on my thesis about eco-humanities and literature. And I will talk about something that inspires me a lot and that has various correlations with the topic of our conference. And I will talk about uh, biophilia multimedia project from 2011 by Icelandic singer-songwriter Björk that unites music making, education, art, nature, science, design, and much more. So if something is in the spirit of this conference uh, multidisciplinary, it's biophilia. And above all, uh, which is, you know, especially uh, interesting, biophilia is the first app album ever which might be perceived as a small revolution in music industry in general. I uh, do you see my uh, PowerPoint pre presentation. I'm not sure if it's if it's functioning. So F five? No, no. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I, okay, I, I, okay. So yeah, I'm. Is there now, Urosh? Is there? It's, it's there now. Okay, great. So Looking I'm, good. I'm okay. Thank you. I'm I'm moving on. So Björk has been known for decades for her unmistakably recognizable voice and uni unique sound that blends something ancient with newest technology. And having that in mind, it's in, it is important to be aware that each of her studio albums, that, and you can see all the uh, album, uh, all, all the cover arts of her albums in the slide, uh, that each of her studio albums are highly uh, conceptual. Every time when she records an album, a new form of music language is made. Björk even creates her own music personas in every album, which is obvious if we take a look at the collection of cover arts. From 1993, when her first solo album came to the present moment, one can witness a real power of artistic evolution. It's not wonder that even though she is quite popular and influential, no one succeeded to sound the same. Björk's work actually represents a genre on its own. Nevertheless, I think that perceiving Björk in terms of avant pop might be a good solution, considering one of her interviews where she said that she is interested in minimalistic elementary structures as well uh, as complex forms. Uh, therefore, it's not a surprise that she is a popular public figure and highly respected in academia. Being simultaneously a celebrity and an innovator can open a lot of possibilities. As someone who has always been uh, self-aware on a theoretical level, Björk decided to make a project which is unprecedented and you can see a cover art of uh, Biophilia uh, in the slide. So at the same time, Biophilia is Björk's seventh studio album, educational app, and which is especially important, the first app which is part of permanent collection in MoMA, Museum of Modern Art in New York, of course. It's also an interactive digital installation, a video game, but also a project of using and creating new musical instruments, uh, both digital and physical. Well, Biophilia itself is also uh, a musical instrument and Björk actually made some songs using apps that her and her collaborators made for, for the project. But you can see also on, on your right-hand side, you can see uh, two instruments. Uh, the first one is called Tesla Coil, uh, and it's made by uh, Nikola Tesla. And it, uh, in order to make music, it, uh, it 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 actually makes sound with thunder and lightning, and it's it's quite exciting. And the second one is called Gravity Harp. Uh, well, Gravity Harp is actually in the middle, of course. And Gravity Harp, I really don't know how 
uh, it functions, but <laughs> it's it's quite interesting because it uh, it's a mixture of of course gravity, harp, and uh, you know we we can see how science and music is uh, are intertwined. And uh, yeah, so York herself composed several songs of biophilia on her iPad. So using using the apps which are made for for the for the um, uh, for for the project. And also, I would like to add that biophilia is much more. It's a concept of design. You have interesting lyrics and to movies, live shows, and so on. But uh, before we continue, I would like to say a few words about, um, I would say like a few words about origin of the term biophilia. Um, so interestingly, it is coined by Eric Fromm, who says that biophilia is the passionate love of life and all that is alive. It is the wish to further grow, whether in a person, a plant, an idea, or a social group. The biophilous person prefers to construct rather than to retain. He is capable of wandering, and he prefers to see some something new rather to, uh, to find confirmation of the old. He loves the adventure of living more than he does certainty. He sees the whole rather than only the parts, structures rather than, sum than summations. He wants to mold and, and to influence by love, reason and example, not by force, by cutting things apart by the bureaucratic manner of administrating people as if they were things. Because he enjoys life and all its manifestations He's not a passionate consumer of newly packaged excitement. And I want to add that in the spirit of feminism, which is close to Bjork's uh, uh, worldview, uh, he would be replaced with she, of course, or, uh, or uh, some sort of different pronoun, of course. So, uh, but uh, biophilia is not only present in work of Eric Fromm, but also uh, it's important part of Edward Wilson's work, which is, uh, and he was a famous American biologist, uh, expert for ants, which is interesting. And he said that uh, biophilia is um, some sort of finite tendency to focus on life and lifelike processes, and that every living being has some sort of tendency towards life itself. And I think that the best way of, uh, the, the, the best thing for presenting the whole story about biophilia would be if I um play you a short overview of the app it's just two or three minutes long i think that we will have enough time for that so i'm going to stop share right now in order to play uh play uh, play it just just a second please so i think uh, that Uroj, you're okay on time because whatever you have five minutes extra Aha, uh -huh, okay, thank you. <laughs> you, you, started, you started five minutes, so, so just add five minutes to okay. where you are. Okay, okay, so, okay, then I can, I can play it right now. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, so, do you he hear the sound? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, I, I think that I need to... Mm -hmm. there is a there is a way where you need to uh make the sound able so you need to uh -huh. a, share the sound there's a, some way to click yeah to yeah share, share the, the sound. sound but i cannot find the aha uh -huh, okay okay it, share it's somewhere sound. on the top mm -hmm. i think that now it's the, it's it's fine now yes it is aha uh -huh, yes it is okay so, so this one is the main app, and it's called Cosmogony. It's some sort of galaxy where all the other apps are. And they say back then our universe. This is interesting because you can actually play some sort of karaoke. Uh, that every every song has. Of that that version, which is quite innovative. Was a coal black egg. Uh, 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 
this is the first song and it's as you can see about about moon and about musical sequences and you can see that mixture organic and electronic which is quite exciting and as you can see you can also play it and make your own music and save your uh, composition if you want to This is my favorite one. Uh, it's quite minimalistic, but really powerful. Uh, it's called Thunderbolt, and it's uh, it's all about arpe arpeggios, which is broken, uh, which is uh, another na name for broken chord. Uh, this is a crystalline. It's like a video game, and it's of course about crystals, and you make your own music with uh, with playing the game. Uh, this one is called Dark Matter and it's about musical scales, both European and non-European. And that's one of the important aspects of biophilia, to think out of the box and out of the... Um, to, to think in a, in a broader way. This one is uh, quite exciting, it's about DNA replica replication. Well, uh, this one might be especially interesting uh, considering the present moment. It's a song about... Uh, it's a love story, basically, between virus and, and cell, which can sound cynical uh, considering the present moment, but still, I think that it's quite interesting. And if you want to hear the song till the end, you must let viruses... Uh, you must let viruses in, unfortunately which is interesting in, in a conceptual level. This one is about, it's called Sacrifice, and it's about a different kind of musical notation, alternative wave, ways of, uh, of notation. And you can basically write your own name if you want to make, uh, make, make a new song. This one is a mutual chord, and it's not about just about geology, but about and this is the last song it's quite elegant and it's about uh, astronomy and uh, it's called Solt solstice and that melody that you can hear it's it's from uh, gravity ha uh, harp that I I mentioned all already. So, just a second. I'm going to continue with my presentation. Okay, so uh, biophilia is in all a multi-sensory call for ex exploration, and I think that it's it's quite exciting that you can also be both a consumer and a participant. Um, and I already said uh, said something about uh, about the structure of biophilia, and there are ten songs, and as I said, every song is about different nature phenomenon. Uh, from viruses to galaxies, but correlation between natural sciences and humanities is, uh, in this case, especially precious and can be used in educational environment. So every curriculum can be enriched by it. And I think that one of the, uh, the best things about biophilia is that holistic um, point of view when you can, uh, at the same time, talk about, for instance, uh, for, for instance, uh, cosmogony, uh, equilibrium in music, uh, and maybe about folklore, about creation myths, about Big Bang. So everything is intertwined, mythology, um, human relationships, um, science, uh, technology. So it's actually some sort of call for, for exploration. And I think that uh, it's, it's something 
which should be an imperative for future education to be overwhelmed by um, by that holistic experience of the world and the totality of the world that um, that uh, biophilia can 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 bring to us. So as you can see, uh, it's it's highly con uh, conceptual, and every uh, every a song brings another another topic, so it can be uh, quite uh, handy actually for uh, educational environment. Um, okay, so just uh, just I want to ju just to briefly mention visual visual aspect of Bjork's performances, costumes, hairstyles, headpieces, and as you can see, there's something quite let's say organic about her outfits and her stage persona is both a uh, power of nature, a teacher. And speaking about her hair, she said once that she was inspired when she was a child herself. She was in, in, inspired by Albert Einstein. So she decided to make something in order to, let's say, pay tribute to them, but also it's some sort of nebula, you know, uh, a galaxy. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting, definitely. And uh, Björk is considered by many experts as a music video genius. And my uh, choice, we, uh, if you want to, to, to play it, uh, we won't do that this time, but my choice uh, this time would be a music video for Mutual Core, uh, which is uh, quite, quite dynamic, vibrant and, and exciting. And you can see how uh, human, non-human uh, world uh, are intertwined. Uh, I just wanted to add that there is a hidden connection between Bjork Ur and Ur philosophy. One more minute. One okay. more minute, Urush. Okay. Uh, uh, so, hidden connection between Bjork and philosophy, especially in the context of Timothy Morton's work. Not many people know that Morton's most famous idea, Hyperobject, was named after Bjork's hit from 1995. Uh, in this slide, you can see something more about biophilia educational projects, and you can search for it online. And I want to, uh, wanted to say that we can see a new paradigm uh, speaking about biophilia in music and participatory art practices, education, uh, some sort of playful uh, encyclopedism, and so on. Thank you for your attention. I hope that you enjoy it. And I'm looking forward for your questions and for other uh, presentations. Thank you once again. Excellent. Thank you, Urash. This was very interesting. Uh, I'm sure that your presentation will be available somewhere. So yeah, of course. you can send it to people if they're interested or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you see Tadas, who works in multimedia, uh, and interdisciplinarity finds it very interesting. So uh, thank you. not thank only you. that you people ask you, but you may forge some links and some connections, which is always important. Okay, so now uh, we will be moving on. I'm trying to get myself onto the camera. Hello. So I'm, I'm now in my office. So this is this is the the Royal Birmingham Conservatory is in the back. Uh, so we're gonna do the switch. Uh, so the, the moderator now of the panel uh, will be uh, Maria Sanchez. And she's going to pick up the moderation. And I will then join you for the uh, panel. Uh, so uh, Maria, you are now with Lizzie Conard Hughes. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm still here. I'm, I'm with you, uh, but I'm, I won't be moderating. Perfect. So, Lizzie, whenever you're ready. Hello. <laughs> Good morning. I need I, I need my partner in crime, Valentina. There's two of us. Ah. We are jointly presenting. I'm Perfect. here. I'm here. Hello, Valentina. Right. Hello. Are you ready? Yes, we're ready. Perfect. So you can Thank you. the screen. All set, Valley. All set. All set. Great. Um, well, before we actually begin, I need very briefly to offer our apologies, as both Valentina and I will have to leave this session early for, for work commitments. Um, I've been called to see a pupil before a seminar, and Valet has another meeting to go to, so we're very sorry. Um, but we look forward to seeing the recording of the remaining presentations, 
and we will hopefully have a little time to take any questions at the end of our presentation. But if not, we're going to be sharing our contact information. So please do get in touch with us subsequently if you have any questions or comments arising from our presentation. So uh, good morning and thank you all for joining us. We are delighted to be presenting to you today, but I need to let you know that Valentina is positive for COVID. So please be sympathetic. Uh, she's isolated at her home, so we're taking all the correct precautions. But, Vale, um, I'm really sorry, I forgot to give you a script. Can oh, you take oh yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, brilliant, yeah. lovely. So, um, to introduce ourselves formally, I'm Lizzie Conrad Hughes, Artistic Director for UK-based theatre company Shake Scene Shakespeare. We are currently the only UK company performing Shakespeare from Hughes only, and for the last two years, we have been part of the live online theatre explosion. And I'm Valentina Vinci, Elise's partner in crime and in Shakespeare, Shakespeare <laughs> a member of the acting company, I'm a, and I am the technical person and know-how behind our line performances. We would like you to introduce you today to a new theatre specialist, a skilled practitioner created during lockdown theatre and to the importance of their new skills. Please meet the online action choreographer. Our presentation is supported by clips from our company's live online performances, featuring the development of action choreography devised by Alexandra Katejida, who you can see on the screen, hopefully. Uh, and Alexandra is a professional actor. She's a stage combat specialist and a stage manager. But since 2020, she has choreographed action for several companies performing online. Come back with us to March 2020, to the first lockdown in the UK. All theatres were closed, all filming units shut down, Everyone was at home, afraid and kind of bored. So the blocked energy of performing arts creatives burst out into live online performances. Our company wanted to offer new live content to isolated audiences all over the world. And to be more than talking heads on screen, we needed to create the illusion of interaction between isolated performers. We wanted our action to match our words. For example, if your line read, give me your hand, my lord, we wanted that to happen. The problem was even simple interactions like handshakes and kisses posed no difficulty on stage, but with isolated actors in different screens, it becomes very challenging. And we had to pass around a lot of objects, mostly coins, rings and letters. Alexandra created a simple discipline. You show the object in your space, it leaves your space, then it can appear in your partner's space and the illusion is complete. This permitted objects to appear in different screens as if handled by more than one person. Ballet, this montage is really brilliant. Well done, mate. Oh, thank you. Yeah, You're very welcome. Sure. It was fun to make. <laughs> well, we never chose a play that would be simple to stage online. We chose plays that we wanted to do and then worked out how to do them. Actually, Lizzie, could yeah. you take Natasha for a moment? She's getting a little bit restless. Yeah, of course. Pass her over. Yeah. Oh, okay. Come on, little one. Come to Auntie Lizzie. We're going to be okay. When we did a history plays in 2021, we discovered crowns required special handling. It was vital that we maintained the appearance of one crown passing between hands to maintain the thread of the story. This increased the difficulty of our action choreographer, as the crown moments needed very careful choreography. Alexandra shared videos between the cast members, directing them how to make their crowns from cardboard and tinfoil. It was lockdown, you know, so no shops were open. And worked with uh, uh, Eugene Lowe and Richard II and Alec Benny, Henry V, to create the illusion of the hollow crown passing from Richard to Henry to Hull, including Sal's removal of Henry's crown, which you've just seen, which required a hand to reach between the screens. And we hope you'll agree these illusions worked very well. Right from the start, we needed to create fights armed and unarmed, no little achievement in online performance. These have developed from our first sword fights in Romeo and Juliet, which you can see on the screen at the moment, which included the illusion of a sword passed between screens, as well as the exchange of armed and unarmed blows to this unarmed wrestling sequence in As You Like It. And I'm gonna pause here because I would love you to watch this. The middle performer is Suzanne Taylor playing Jeanne the wrestler and she is currently throttling uh, Orlando. And there she goes. And there he goes. Yeah. And Lady that, wrestler is <laughs> definitely winning right now. I've seen these before, but they never cease to entertain me. 
because the guys worked so hard. And this was and so long ago. <laughs> this is one of our very earliest plays. This is 2020. And they go in for the throttle and that's it. Okay, uh, this progressed into group fights. Here is the death of Sinner the Poet uh, from Julius Caesar, uh, also featuring a mob using found object choreogra fight choreography, including inspired use of a fight frying pan by crowd number three. And it's culminated in a fight from Coriolanus, one of our most recent plays where you see Valentina as Caius Martius using a rock and if you follow the rock, there is the illusion of it passing between three screens as part of this fight between Orphidius and three, oh, two others. There it goes. And it got boom, and it caught third person. <laughs> this sequence from the physically demanding play Titus Andronicus, very physically demanding, required kneeling, grabbing, pushing, and gagging. We wanted to make this sequence as physically realized as possible to create the fullest possible experience for the audience. Kneeling is relatively simple. If the actor has not room to lower their own level, the laptop or phone is raised. Uh, there is a good demonstration here of the discipline system of physical signals. Demetrius clearly showed his hand before reaching to grab Lavinia. This signally enables the actor to coordinate their timing as accurately as Zoom delays permit. A feature of on-stage choreography, really, repurposed for online action. Mm. An added bonus of working online with this freedom of between screen action is how easy it is to work with disabled actors and actors in different countries. In the Slovenia sequence, Chiron, played by Tom Jackson Wood, who suffers from ME and fibromyalgia, is in a wheelchair. Demetrius, Simon Balkan, is hearing impaired, and Lavinia, Tamara Ritala, is in Germany. Yet the sequence plays out perfectly. Performing online, we can also work with chronically ill actors without them becoming exhausted. In this clip, Ian Peacock, who has multiple sclerosis, is gallantly fighting Matt Williams, who is in London, while being at home in Stockholm Trent, and he is able to rest between scenes. We can connect with, right, with actors right across the USA, with our two regular players who are based over there, Aaron in New York, as Hotspur over here is fighting Alec Benny in East London, united on a virtual battlefield. There is also an equity of opportunity and appearance in size on screen. Here, King Richard III is a person with dwarfism. This actor, Fergus Rattigan, could take on anyone on stage as well, as he is trained in stage combat, but online, only the skill of those involved catches the eye. Fergus here is fighting Alexandra herself, the choreographer, as Richmond, with a neat little illusion to show Richard's death blow received. Here it goes. And here he comes. We've dealt with a lot of blood in various forms, frequently catch up over the last couple of years. Accommodating the new discipline of action choreography has produced a new form of script layout as well. As our company's book holder, Lizzie, is responsible for preparing scripts, she identifies and incorporates actions which she cues in the scripts themselves, uh, even creating choreography suggestions to support Alexandra's process of the choreography. For example, in this slapstick sequence that you've just seen, performed by Matt and Dewey uh, for Comedy of Errors, their scripts just read, Slap, slap, punch. And that's what happened. Happily for me, if any actions are missed during the script preparation, the company are now so skilled at the discipline that they can do them extempore. The wish behind creating these action conventions was exactly this, a physical language that the company knew and could easily use, as with dance, combat and intimacy choreography. After two years, the technique has become part of their skill set. And thanks to their dedication and Alexandra's constant development of the techniques, we have a new physical language of coordinated actions worthy to stand beside other established choreography conventions. The creation of online performance is the closest our generation has come to the experience of those who lived through the rise of the Renaissance playhouses or moving pictures in Hollywood, radio or television. In each case, those involved developed their new craft around them as they went. We're honored to have been part of this innovation process. 
There are hundreds of hours of online performance footage from Shake Scene, all created since March 2020, and all presenting fully embodied performances thanks to the vision of our physical action choreographer, Alexandra Katayigida, and to all our amazing actors. We are still performing regularly live online as we are passionately committed to the creative possibilities this new performance medium offers. Thank you for listening. Well done, partners. Great job. Bring it in. Oh, same to you, Valentina. <laughs> Thank you all for your attention. Um, if we have time now, is it appropriate to say, are there any questions or is it better for the panel to move on? Uh, we have finished. Yeah, well, we have uh, all the questions are supposed to be in the panel, but because you won't be able to be there and we have like uh, a couple of minutes if anyone wants to ask anything. If sure. not, then our contact details are there on screen. So yeah, um, please do get in touch with us afterwards. Perfect. So thank you very much, both Lisi and Valentina. That was a really fun presentation. And uh, yeah, lots of different resources and ways of playing with choreograph on screen. So thank you very much. Uh, so now we have Megan. Megan, are you ready? Yeah, perfect. So yeah, we're all set. Uh, Iman is with me as well. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Hello. So whenever you're ready, you can just start your presentation. Great, thank you, Maria. Um, we will have to leave just after. I know Iman has rehearsal to get to and I'm in Canada, so it's 3 a.m. for me. So I gotta head off after this. Uh, we won't speak for long because we won't have a film that we're going to share with you all. Uh, so just to start off, my name is Megan. I am the project manager for the arts initiative, Open Arms for Art. Uh, based in Jordan. I'm also an applied theater practitioner. I've seen many of those today in this part of the panel. Um, and I love to work in the connected space between applied art practice and international development. So while I was completing my master's in applied theater at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, I traveled to Ramallah in uh, occupied Palestine to intern with Ashtar Theater, uh, who Iman, of course, is the director of. We um, while I was there, I met the late performer Wiam al Uh, We lived together and we became good friends. After this very impactful experience of working in theater with youth in the West Bank, Wiam sent to me a piece that she had written and asked me to help produce it. So this piece covered an overview of five fictionalized Palestinian women's experiences with gender-based violence. Unfortunately, she passed away shortly after and many of us who were missing her presence came together to create this piece in her memory. So not just myself to produce, but Iman um, as co-director, uh, our friend Alia from, who joined us from Australia uh, as director and Christine Abdullah, the main performer who joined us as well from Palestine. So this piece was created on a zero dollar budget and across several continents. Uh, we initially conceived of this piece as an in-person performance, but because of the pandemic, we had to adjust our methods. Um, however, this new push for work for performance in online and digital spaces also created the opportunity for us all to meet and work towards that. Uh, we were able to include in the performance five different voice actors, including Christine and Iman, and others who had no experience with performing or some previous experience. And this allowed for the piece to be participatory, to gather women with shared experiences uh, of displacement or occupation, and rehearsals were able to create a space to reflect and talk on these themes. It also created the option for one of the performers to remain anonymous, to protect their identity as a displaced person and still participate as you will see. As we know, the incidences of gender-based violence increase uh, intensively during situations of crisis or war or occupation. And this is something to be crucially aware of. And indeed in this piece, the occupation is the other character. As well, it's incredibly important to have these conversations and raise awareness. I know we were able to have a premiere at Ashtar Theater uh, of the film in Ramallah, which spurred conversations and discussions from viewers. And it has also been part now of the Seagull Film Festival in New York. Uh, so this has been a benefit to creating this piece as a film that was initially conceived as performance and that it can be shared and reshared. Um, thank you. Iman, go ahead. Thank you, Megan. 
Uh, thank you for having us uh, on this panel. Um, of course, uh, to follow what uh, Megan had uh, just said, um, I met uh, uh, and trained uh, We Am Adiri, uh, our late friend, um, when she was uh, residing in Gaza in 2010 as a young girl uh, when she was 14, and she participated at uh, the renowned uh, project uh, Gaza Monologues that were uh, viral uh, throughout the globe. And um, um, we am uh, studied a theater with Ashtar Theater in Gaza, and then she moved uh, to the West Bank uh, and she worked with the, our company. Now, uh, one important factor about uh, this work is also um, being uh, in uh, um, uh, during COVID uh, in uh, uh, closure and uh, closed environment, uh, as Megan said, uh, violence had accelerated uh, among households, especially against women and, and children. So uh, we wanted uh, very much to uh, uh, to produce this uh, uh, this work because of that. And because the uh, the work is really raising issues of uh, uh, of gender violence, and how uh, women live in in Palestine, but not only um, in uh, it it can it can happen anywhere and uh, uh, everywhere that is uh, facing uh, war and uh, and occupation. Um, of course, this uh, uh, joint event, uh, joint venture, uh, was uh, an important one, uh, not only on the artistic level, but also on the uh, social and emotional level, because um, as artists living in, in different parts of the world, it, it became much uh, important for all of us uh, to share um, solidarity and to think together, especially that uh, the pandemic had uh, put us on um, on a new uh, verge of uh, uh, of closing down uh, the, the sphere of, uh, of this uh, globe and making us all uh, able to, to really share on, uh, on the digital world um, our lives uh, in, in such a form that, that is quick and, uh, and possible and easy. Uh, and therefore, um, the uh, presence of many uh, young women from different parts of the of the continents uh, had had been such a uh, a rewarding aspect to this uh, event um, because it uh, it was able to uh, uh, to open up uh, the space while it was so much closed down. Um, so uh, the uh, I, I wanted just to share that, uh, um, I mean, the, the COVID had really uh, um, shed light on the fact that we uh, artists, uh, this is our uh, this is our new domain. This is our new way of uh, of living together. We can reach out uh, easily, and we have a duty towards each other. And uh, it is important uh, that we create uh, uh, a better world uh, among us, but also for uh, the rest of the world. Thank you. I leave you with the uh, with Megan and the film. Just checking if everyone can see the screen OK. Yes, we can see it. انت ما رح ترجعي تتجوزي وتتطلعي اذكري اذا بدك تعيشي في هذا المجتمع بدك تتحملي وتضلي ساكته ولي طريقه كيف تتعايشي بس يرجع زوجك على الدار كوني مرتب حالك على اخر طرز الاسلام بحبوا يشوفوا البنت مغريه ولا بتزوج عليك ممنوع تركبي بس كليك. ممكن يعطلك وتخسري حالك مش حلو تركضي في الشارع مشان أنوستك ما تهزهز شايري المدير دلعي عشان يعطيك علاوة 
راتب وترقية كان عمري 14 سنة كنت أطلع مع بنات وولاد حارتي نلعب في الشارع بعد المدرسة كنت بحب ألعب على البسكليت كتير وكنت كمان بحب ألعب الجمباز وفي يوم طلعت ألعب مع صحباتي ريهام وفداء أنا بلعب حسيت بوجع كتير غريب في بطني فداء صارت تحكي لي شوفي ما البنطلونك كله أحمر أنا خفت كتير ومش عارف من وين إجا الدم فجأة أخوي الكبير شافني وحكالي تعالي على البيت أنا حكيت له هيني جاي بس هو إجا أسرع مني مسكني مسكني من شعري وحكالي اطلعي خلي أمك تفهمك شو الدم يلي على بنطلونك وهي آخر مرة بشوف فيها بتلعبي في الحارة وأنا مش فاهمة ليش ليش بحكي لي ممنوع ألعب بعد هلأ إمي حكت لي يما هاي الدورة الشهرية يعني صرتي عروس يما دخلت على غرفتي أنا ببكي ببكي من وجع العروس وكمان مش فاهمة شو يعني عروس فجأة سمعت أخوي بحكي لأمي من بكرة بتجيبي لها منديل لتلبسه لبنتك وممنوع تكشف شعرها قدام الغريب وحتى أولاد عمها وإذا صار إجا خطابين خليها تطلع تشوفهم معدل كتير حلو 88.6 أدبي من وأنا صغيرة كان حلمي أطلع مذيعة وكل الناس تشوفني على التلفزيون أنا الحقيقية عمي إجا يبارك بنجاحي وسألني شو حابة تخصصي في الجامعة يا عمي حكيت له إعلام بدي أصير مذيعة فجأة كاسة العصير اللي في إيده وقعت وصار يصرخ علي وعلى أبوي وعلى أمي ويحكي شو الفضيحة اللي بدك تدرسيها ناوية تفضحيني بدك كل الناس تحكي علي أنا اللي ما بقطع ولا فرد بدك تخصصي تخصص في اختلاط مع الشباب وتطلعي على التلفزيون والناس تشوف جسمك وجهك وحكى لبابا أنا مش رح أسمح لبنتك تدخل هذا التخصص وإذا درسته لا أنا أخوك ولا بعرفك إذا بدها تدرس تخصص خليها تتخصص في إشي فيش فيه اختلاط في العمل بصحى الصبح من الساعة خمسة بنظف البيت وبصحي ابني عشان البسه لمدرسته وقبل ما اطلع على الشغل بعمل فطور لجوزي لانه على الثمانيه لازم اكون في شغلي واول ما اخلص شغل بروح البيت بسرعه لانه الاربع ونص وقت مهم كثير بحياتنا لانه جوزي حبيبي انسان منظم وبحب كل شيء يكون على التكه جاهز والغداء هذا فرض واجب لازم يكون جاهز على الاربع ونص وإلا ما بتضل طنجرة في البيت ما بتتكسر عراسي إلا طنجرة الضغط هي الوحيدة اللي جوزي مستفيد منها عقولته بحبها بحبها كتير وطبعاً 
جوزي قاعد في البيت على طول ما شاء الله معه ماستر قاعدة وتأمل في البيت بس الحمد لله يطلع معي مرة واحدة بالشهر يوم ما ينزل راتبي بينزل معي عشان نقبضه بشتري لي ضمة ورد هذاك اليوم بيكون هاد بمثابة اليوم العالمي للحب بيننا أعمل مقابلة عشان أشتغل والحمد لله أنا قبلت بالوظيفة لأنه عندي خبرة وشهادات وتدريب منيح لكن أول ثلاث شهور الراتب مبدئيا حيكون 1500 شيكل وبعد فترة التجربة وعني المدير بزيادة في الراتب بلشت شغل وأنا بكل قواي وطاقتي ومبسوطة والمدير حكى لي أنت زي بنتي وأنا رح خاف عليك حكم إنه خمسين فشي أسبوع بيبلش شغلي وبلش يدوشني بقصص مرته وإنه هي مقصرة في حقه ومش عم تترتب وتلبس مثلي بلش يغازلني إيه اللي يا ريت لو أنت مرتي بلش يعرض علي إذا بينفع يوصلني بعد الدوام أو ممكن نطلع نتغدى مع بعض بيصير يحكي لي ما تقلقي بموضوع الراتب والترقية لأنه أنا راح ظبطك فلا تقلقي بجوزك بقول له ما بيزبط إلا هو قرب مني مسكني من قميصك حاول إنه يتحرش فيه ومن يومها ضليت في البيت ما حكيت أنا كنت عايشة في البيت لحالي مع أولادي بعد ما جوزي طلقني كل يوم الجيش بتطب علينا على البيت بده يانا نطلع منه كل يوم كل يوم يجوا بكسروا وبضربوا وبطلعوا في يوم هجم علي جندي وضربني وسبب لي كسور في العمود الفقري ولما أجا ابني دافع عني قتلوه واعتقلوا ابني الثاني وحطوه في السجن وضليت انا وبنتي في البيت لحالنا بس انا ما عندي خيار ثاني ما عندي خيار غير اني اضل في البيت هو الوحيد اللي ضل لي اعيش فيه انا وبنتي لانه ولا حدا راح يسال فينا اذا طلعنا منه لا حكومه ولا امن ولا زوج ولا اهل ولا حتى جيران Maria, we can't hear you. Sorry. No, I was just thinking uh, for, for your presentation on the video. Would you like to add something else? 
Um, I would say that um, just one thing that uh, a small reminder that uh, we am uh, is from Gaza and Gaza uh, has been uh, under siege for the last 15 years now and the people are really living the experience of uh, uh, closure <laughs> in the world uh, they have they have experienced it for three months or or a little bit more and a little bit less uh, but uh, there are uh, two million people uh, experience experiencing that closure for the last 15 years not able to really leave uh, the um, the gaza strip and uh, and they they've been facing um four con consecutive wars on them um so uh, this is where uh, we am come from and this is why we am was uh, uh, so um, passionate also about, about talking about women and what happens usually to women when you are stuck in one place. So if, if the people want to ask any question before we leave, just because we need to, to fly, as Megan said, she's, uh, it's already uh, dawn soon to her and, and I have a rehearsal to go to. So if there is a, a, any question, otherwise, uh, like our um, friends, uh, you, can, you can also contact us later. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes. So if anyone wants to ask anything. I've also put our contacts in the chat for anybody that wants to reach out. Thank you. Right, so thank you very much, both of you, as I was saying, a very powerful piece. So yeah, looking forward to continue seeing your work in the future. And we've got now uh, Ma Maria, Maria Barna. I don't know if you're here. Yes, you are. I don't know if you're ready. Maria. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's connecting now. I oh, know. Okay, let's. Maria, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yeah, so Maria is not answering, and I think the next presenter, who are Milia and Elena and Peter, are still not here or at least i cannot see you <laughs> well milian milian um you're here i don't know if you maybe we can just uh, start with your presentation and if maria can connect later she can connect hello hello can you can hear me <laughs> yes i can hear you i'm sorry it's my first time present no via Zoom platform <laughs> just to find my PowerPoint presentation. I don't know how to share it. Just a second. Yeah, there is. Uh, maybe I can send the link. Sorry? Can you? I don't know. Just a second yeah. to share the... The screen, yeah. I don't know how this works. So we got in the chat your presentation, but if, for example, yes. you go um, in the bottom of the screen, there is an icon with a square, an arrow that share, says share a screen. So you can click that. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Share a screen. Gamification. 
Mm. Yeah, I think it's coming up now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, we can but see that. It's uh, a little bit bad presentation. It's still. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, can we <laughs> start like this? Yep, perfect. Okay. Okay, first, of all, I'm sorry because I'm late for this session. I didn't come at, at the beginning. Uh, my name is Midan, and now I will present my paper work. It's about gamification in art, implementation of elements of video games in works of art using the augmented reality method. First, I will talk about some key terms. Uh, first one is about gamification. Gamification is a process that applies one or more elements from video games in various scientific and artistic disciplines. The connection between the, the dynamics of video games as performing arts and digital visual art is noticeable in the use of new technologies. The implementation of video game mechanics such as text, graphics, moving images, and sound, in combination with the, the digital environment, allows a user a new kind of interaction with works of art in real time. Feedback when interacting with works that use some of the elements of video games is reflected in the form of achievement, promotion, or collaboration in, in virtual environments. The goal of art and gamification is to include the widest possible audience as active participants in new virtual worlds, spaces that can shape by themselves. The next topic is about is augmented reality is a method and a special type of communication com uh, combines the mechanics of video games with the work of art. Augmented reality connect physical space with virtual. At one end is a work of art and the other is a virtual space of video games. Communication between physical and virtual space usually takes place by adding virtual elements to physical reality and vice versa. The concept of gamification, first of all, the term gamification was first used in the context of entertainment software by Gabe Zicherman in 2008. He presented the idea of using elements of video games outside the entertainment industry. The rapid popularization of gamification occurred in mid 2010, when due to the growing development of new technologies, software and hardware components, new methods of interaction through virtual and augmented reality and new technical an expressive possibility is in creating alternative, alternative realities, users have the opportunity to work with real and virtual space. Gamification is first of all a process that aims to engage users and turn them into active participants. As one of the basic elements of video games is solving, ta solving tasks that are supported by constant feedback, such as achievement, tables of awards for successfully passive levels or something else, we try to imply these elements in other areas of expression. The use of interactive components of video games is solving various tasks from other areas, it represent a new way of thinking and engaging with individuals or group of participants. The process of gamification has become the subject of research in a wide range of non-profit activities. It has become one of the popular ways to attract customers to a particular market segments because it provides the ability to attract and retain customers. And if her primary intention is not entertainment, but feedback, even in the entertainment, even in the small form aims to stimulate the user. Next one is gamification in art. Elements of video games are used to attract users. Their future in interaction and interest. In the performing and visual arts, the process of gamification and the creation of video game, like the dynamics 
and also available through the use of high and low, and low technologies, depending on desire, desired visual and technical quality. There are also tools wow. that allow a simple process of integrating elements of video games into works of art that easily allow the in incorporation of game mechanics into work in a relatively short time. Some gamification mechanics that can be applied in works of art can be divided into four categories. First one is achievement, where you earn points, level, levels, awards, recognition, and gifts. The second one is competition, a table of leaders, various challenges that depend on human interaction. The next one is cooperation. It's about social relations, about uh, discovery and teamwork. Ownership, build something of your own in the game about loyalty and self-expression while, while creating them. In order to create your own works of art that use element of gamification, you need a certain knowledge of video game design theory. The designers of video games, which have been published in the ten, last, uh, in last 10 years, wanted to push the line between entertainment, entertainment and art. The adoption of the game as a tool in creating artistic parts has yet to be widely used. The common features of video games and art is creativity and the desire to present the worlds, virtual worlds, often fictional, the more intensely the experience and uh, where they can participate in them, in them. These different worlds, which can often be realized in different media, have several properties that make them interesting these worlds become a kind of personal utopia that users dream of visiting. Fantasy is an important concept in games that some claim is more important than the story. In transmedia worlds, it's no longer necessary to focus only on creating experience in one medium. The task of the creators of this world, virtual spaces, is to exist, excite users by creating, creatively giving them a new perspective on a joint newly composite worlds. Now I will present some examples. There are three different types. First is about games. Uh, video games are slowly becoming a special art field. Their, their development is linked with the development of computers and computer graphics. Today, most popular and successful and successfully video games are advancing in their, in their user interface in terms of, of socializing, but also in terms of visual and technical sophistication. Mixed reality spaces, which combine real space with virtual, allow users to express new worlds. For example, Minecraft and Fortnite have doubled the number of users thanks to platform that gave an immediate feeling of being, being in the game. Pokemon Go is probably one of the most successful, uh, successful transmedia worlds of all time, and the game that makes the best use of augmented reality method in the performing in performance mode. The graphics and action of the game are not sufficiently uh, advanced, but the interaction are rich and interesting, as the team spent five years probably uh, properly balancing the game. The power of the Pokemon game is not only in the concept of the game, but in the careful and consistent use of multiple me media to define one world well. Next one is about one artist project. It's about Rimini Protocol, best before. And first of all, it's necessary to make a difference between video games as art and the use of game elements in works of art. The first presentation about Pokemon Go is about Video games has art and the uh, Rimini protocol best before is about use of game elements in works of art. Video games generally have the basic rough, uh, raw rule of entertaining users and all its components are subordinate to achieve these goals. The gameplay of the game consists in the degree of interactivity that the game includes in the extent to which the player is able to participate in the game world and how the, that world reacts to the choice the player has made. The project Rimini Protocol, best before, by Helgard Howe and Stefan Kegel, combines virtual play with 
audience and connect it to the intimate theatrical settings. With the game controller in one hand on, and on, in both hands, each of the members of the audience begin as an anonymous avatar or so-called actor, interesting, uh, interacting with a panel of experts on stage, a graphic designer, game tester, a politician, and the person who control traffics. Taking inspiration from the video game industry in Vancouver, the new world, Best Land, is evolving as participants make personal, social, and political decision. decision. They clash, cooperate, and negotiate with the forces that shape their own reality. The next one is about Tate Modern Museum. Here, they are also using the gamification. The boundaries between play and art are blurred. The next example that uses gamification is the Tate Museum, an application for a series of games for different audience with different goals. Gamification of a museum collection can be a way to make the digital offer more societally interactive and attractive. Efforts to gamify museum collection in order to attract audience and increase audience engagement are not entirely new. And, pre and previous examples of such efforts have tried to take advantage of the best elements of the most successful video game. Tate Worlds, launched by the Tate Museum in 2015, for years he has been using the Minecraft game platform to create a series of three-dimensional maps inspired by works of art from their collection. The audience is able to explore them and get to know the works from their collection in a new, fun, and existing, exciting way through gamification. The gamification of artistic cultural works in order to attract the museum to younger and wider audience makes a lot of sense in the market. Building interactive game-like experience around museum treasures and works of art requires investment, imagination, and time. The use of augmented reality method in implementation of elements of video game in works of art. Augmented reality, its connect, its contents and technologies allow users to experience virtual environments united with the real world. Augmented reality together with virtual reality as a virtual upgrade of works of art with elements of video games allow users to experience different reality or alternative reality. The implementation of the elements of gamification in works of art is achieved by the method of augmented reality. A specially created application for smart devices, they enable the overlapping of the virtual world with the elements of video games with a real physical dimension of works of art. The application works by scanning the, uh, the art template, which serves as the basis and then a specially designed gamified virtual space is launched on the smart devices. This gamified virtual space is stored online. This procedure, procedure brings together and synthesizes virtual space with the real. With the interactive virtual upgrade of artistic templates and at first glance, the passive observer becomes more active because use of new technologies requires voluntary action. When operating the devices, the observers makes decision on future progress and mastering all levels of virtual space. Decisions are limited to predetermined tasks. During the time, the user receives constant confirmation of their achievement, and at the end of the game, they receive a prize or something else. Uh, the next, the last topic is about my artistic project. It's about uh, called Multiber. The Multiber art project used the process of, gamica of gamification in the classic painting process as a process of turning something into a game, adding one or more mechanics from, from a video games aims to create an interactive work of art that will completely change the angle of view of traditional art composition, changing the approach from static form, form to open real-time interaction structure. The interaction process would take place using augmented reality media and scanning the painted template using smart devices. 
After a mechanical start of the phones, a specially created gamified virtual space will be launched. The approach to the art project is from the angle of narratological interpretation. The narratological approach is about the research, uh, cognitive role that the user has when exploring virtual space. The gameplay of the project, which consist, uh, consists of the combination of moving images, graphics, and sound, take place in augmented reality space in which the action of the gamified space and the interactivity of the users take place. The title of the word, Multsebe, refer, refers to the last third level of the game when it is necessary to defeat the Greek Roman god of fire, Multsebe, who took the form of the dragon. It's necessary to cross the first level, well, which consists of the linear adventure, passing through, through interact roads to the exit. In the second level, it's necessary to, def to defend yourself from volcanic eruption. And after passing all levels of the game, the participants receive a prize, a small form of graphic with motives from the game. I'm sorry, that is all. Maybe it's too fast, but I think it's... Uh, it's better to send you uh, full uh, text than just reading it yeah. this bad. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> uh, it's uh, way too easier for me to, to write things than to present it <laughs> like this. Don't worry. Um, I think it, it was really interesting. So what we're going to um, do, we're going to just keep the questions for the panel discussion, which okay. will be starting at in 20 minutes. OK, so, maybe. Sorry, I was a little bit too confused, maybe. No, it wasn't. It was great. It was great. And <sighs> I see lots of interest aligned with my own research. <laughs> so we need... I'm still to... too young. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you're, you so you're much. Welcome. I will send the full text. This is just uh, some short... Uh, Perfect. Yeah, that would be that would be really helpful. So okay. we're gonna. Marija is now with us. <laughs> so whenever you want to present, I think now everything is working. At least we can see you. Yes, and we can hear you. That's perfect. So if you would like to share your screen. Well, I have a presentation which is like kind of, I'm doing it with the virtual camera. I hope it's gonna work. This is the first time I will use a streaming software for my presentation. So I'm sorry if there will be any technical difficulties in advance. Then if that happens, I will just have to drop the presentation and talk without it, but, uh, or share the screen, we'll see. But hopefully, okay, you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you and see you very well. Thank okay. You. So, um, hello, uh, and please interrupt me if you stop uh, hearing me or seeing me or uh, anything, because I'm not uh, looking at you, but at myself uh, right now. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, my name is Maria Barna Lipkowski. Uh, I am uh, a research uh, assistant and a PhD candidate of scene design at the Faculty of Technical uh, Sciences in Novi Sad. Uh, in my BA and MA, I was educated as a theater director at the Faculty of Dramatic Arts in Belgrade and in Berlin at Ernst Busch, Hochschule für Schauspielkunst. And uh, I see uh, artistic practice and theater directing as my main uh, vocation. And uh, this uh, theoretical uh, research, and not just this, but all the theoretical research that I do uh, as a kind of a support uh, for my uh, artistic persona <laughs> and for my artistic work uh, and a way to stay connected with the, with the flow of thoughts in the real world. Uh, outside of the arts world. And uh, as a theater director, I have been always uh, drawn, uh, drawn to focus on uh, uh, human behavior and the situation of crisis. And I have especially uh, been uh, observing these uh, two things in the context of a digital uh, world or digital space or digital, digital circumstances, however we like to call it. And uh, uh, these uh, facts brought me immediately to kind of try and observe uh, the situation 
uh, or the not the, the situation in Ukraine or the war in Ukraine in itself, but the social media image and the social media reaction that it has been getting because since that is my main for, uh, source of information and uh, actually that is how I, I experience this war and this is the case for most of the people um, here. And uh, also I will have to say that I fo focus mostly on the Western uh, or semi-Western perspective uh, on the whole thing because uh, not just that I feel myself uh, more a part of the Western culture than of any any other, but also because um, this is uh, the information that is available to me uh, uh, on the internet. So this is uh, my title, the hashtag battle of uh, Ukraine. And um, it is uh, important for me just to say that uh, as far as I know, it is uh, not uh, easy to, or it is not also easy for me to uh, talk about uh, conflict uh, that is affecting many people from a point of view of a social phenomenon. Uh, I would like to quote uh, Paul Virilio, this uh, philosopher of speed, acceleration, and uh, digital computing and warfare, as a matter of fact, uh, in my defense, uh, even though nobody attacked me, it's all in my head, but uh, the quote says, the careful framing of the screen and the moment of broadcast today reorganized the narrative of a conflict too quickly to be publicly analyzed. As for those who still believe you should wait before writing history, they are living in the wrong century. So this is my basic motivation uh, to try and analyze the situation. Uh, but before I start uh, actually doing it, I would like to define the term performativity since it is very elusive and very often used uh, term and it means many different things. So I think it's important that I say what I think when I say performative. Um, this is the quote I borrowed from Dan Oki or Slobodan Jokic, a photographer. And it basically means in plain words that to perform means to an act or a process which is executed with an acute sense of the audience. So to perform means to know that you are being watched. Uh, and um, what digital br brings uh, as, um, so to say, innovation in this, uh, in this being watched uh, feeling is the self-observation. It's these brackets uh, here, which means that I can also be the audience uh, of my own self. And uh, in this uh, context of uh, what is performativity and what it means for me, I will have to uh, also uh, just uh, note uh, John McKenzie and his uh, work, uh, Perform or Else, which came out in 2001, as for me, a seminal work explaining uh, how today's world works. <laughs> and uh, for him, uh, and also for me, performativity or performance is the main uh, paradigm of uh, the contemporary society. So he says that uh, performativity in the 20th and the 21st century is the same thing which uh, Foucault, for Foucault discipline was in the 18th and 19th century. So it is the, to quote him, onto historical formation of power and knowledge. Uh, and um, he uh, also um, sees three main paradigms of performativity in today's world. One is artistic uh, performance, which we have been mostly concerned with in this conference. Uh, the second one is the organizational performance or performance management. And uh, the third one being uh, technological uh, performance or techno performance, uh, which he uh, which is going to be most, um, so to say, important for me in this particular discourse. 
And um, apart from defining performativity and performance as the main stratum uh, of uh, today's uh, society, he also points out that performativity is both an experimentational and a normative process. So it is not just a place, a liminal place like uh, performance uh, studies and performance arts teach us, uh, but it is also a normative process, a repetitive process in which um, by repeating repeating something we are trying to we are starting to identify with it uh, like in uh, gender uh, performative gender identity theories so when we understood this we can look uh, that uh, at his two uh, meta models uh, that he brings to under for us to understand what he means by the uh, techno uh, performance and these two meta models both uh, the digital computer and the seeking missile uh, somehow meet in the hashtag battle of ukraine uh, that is going on actively <laughs> as we speak and um, he uh, points the, which is also not very, um, so to say, not very unimportant for uh, this uh, um, subject that the whole uh, performativity paradigm started raising after or during the Cold War, so after the Second World War. And uh, just fun, some, some symbolical trivia, so to say, is that the digital computer was born, the von Neumann machine, which is the basic of the digital computer of today, was born uh, by in the same year as the atom bomb, which was the beginning of the Cold War, and the internet, which is the paradigm of today's digital computing, was born at the same year when the Berlin Wall fell uh, in 89, uh, which was, so to say, the end of Cold War. Uh, and so digital computing and uh, seeking missiles meet in uh, Ukraine <laughs> and uh, or on the internet uh, side of this conflict. Uh, and so what is very important to note that after this uh, hashtag battle is not uh, new or an isolated phenomena, it has a long history of media warfare, which is actually, so to say, the warfare uh, paradigm that started after uh, the Cold War and uh, just to mention so from the 90s from the uh, Gulf War which was uh, broadcast live 24 hours on television during the Iraqi War which was also broadcast live 24 hours on television but also had uh, first uh, times in history or not first time but the first time on the internet leakage uh, of uh, unshown footage uh, of um, army brutality uh, in Iraq. And um, last but not the least, I have to mention in the context of Ukraine, a Syrian uh, war or Syrian conflict, which is also an ongoing conflict. Uh, because in Syria, uh, Syrian war started as the Syrian uprising, which was, um, so to say, uh, a part of the Arab Spring, and the Arab Spring was um, um, seen and was also advertised as a grassroots movement uh, by this uh, new network, uh, tech savvy uh, youth, Arab youth uh, in um, Egypt and Syria and other places. Uh, which were supposed to bring uh, democracy as a grassroots movement. So in, from inside, not as an imperial project of uh, the Western powers as it was. And um, Syrian war soon became far too complicated to be adequately mediatized and uh, known what is good and what is bad and uh, what uh, who is the good guy and who is the bad guy there. Uh, but it brought us this uh, image of uh, like us uh, activists. So an Arab who is uh, almost like us, he speaks great English, he drinks alcohol, he's tech savvy, dresses in the same clothes. And this image is very important for us in order to understand this uh, digital empathy, uh, which I'm talking about, uh, which I will be talking about in the context of uh, Ukraine. So now let's uh, go quickly 
to uh, the uh, Ukraine uh, and look uh, at some uh, phenomena uh, which has uh, surfaced uh, during this uh, uh, conflict. And I would first and uh, foremost uh, want to uh, just briefly mention the uh, Vladimir, the figure of Vladimir Zelensky, who became uh, very quickly a hero of many and not without a good reason. Uh, and uh, it is not uh, uh, by accident, uh, in my opinion, uh, that uh, Vladimir Zelensky is an actor and uh, to say a comedian. And uh, it is uh, what ha he has been doing and the way he has become a hero in the eyes of many is that he has been performing or advocating uh, his um, points to different audiences, both to political and to popular audiences around the world using digital means. Uh, and um, this is actually, in my opinion, why he has become an ideal uh, hero. So not just because uh, of taking the stance against a much uh, stronger enemy, but because the way he is making that stance is uh, completely according uh, to the way the uh, uh, power and knowledge are being formed, the performative way. And as such, he has become an ideal uh, 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 hero for the ones who like him and an ideal anti-hero for the ones who hate him. Uh, so yeah, for the likers to like and for the haters to hate. Uh, as a second, uh, uh, phenomena. I would like to briefly grow, go over the conflict uh, of uh, Meta versus Russia, uh, Meta being uh, Facebook. Uh, and so uh, what happened uh, here is that uh, the tweet on the left is uh, referring to uh, the fact that uh, Facebook banned uh, Russian state-owned media outlets in Europe. And um, as a response, uh, a couple of days later, uh, Russia banned uh, Facebook, Twitter, and also some nine days later, to, uh, Instagram uh, from uh, itself, from Russia, so restrained Russian citizens uh, from using it. And uh, this whole conflict is, uh, and that is what the, the, the Vladimir Zelensky tweet is referring to. He is thanking them for doing this and recognizing that this is not just a battle on the ground, but a battle of informational space, or so to say, of an image within this informational space. And um, so this conflict is uh, further evolving. And uh, just recently after the... Uh, recent events in Bucha, uh, the um, Facebook has loosened its policies on hate speech uh, and uh, calling for violence against uh, Russian soldiers, not Russian civilians, and uh, the um, figures of uh, Vladimir Putin and his puppet, uh, the Belarusian uh, President Lukashenko. So uh, it's an ongoing uh, conflict. And um, is uh, fake news, I won't go now uh, because I don't know how much time I have left, but not so much. I wouldn't want to go in the depth of it. Five more minutes if you want. Five more minutes. Okay, so uh, it's not that bad. <laughs> Uh, yeah, fake news have been surfacing on both sides. Uh, this is, uh, so to say, uh, not so to say, but this is allegedly uh, a video that Russian Defense Ministry released of its uh, flying jets. And as you can see in the comment section, there is many comments analyzing of why is this fake, uh, like didn't drop any missiles, and um, it looks like a cockpit video of a training exercise and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, also on the other side, on the Ukrainian side, as um, uh, there has surfaced many uh, fake news, uh, the most notably was the ghost of Kiev, which was also a video uh, who, who, which came actually from uh, the um, uh, video game, 
uh, and this is confirmed. Uh, this is the Digital Combat Simulator World video game. And the whole point is that this video was uh, posted on YouTube by a guy who in the, in the description of the video says that it is from the simulator so that this is not real footage. But he also recorded some uh, commenting over it which sounds real. So through the endless circle of reposting, the fact that it's not real got lost uh, until it was rediscovered by fact checking. And um, so as the last uh, but not least uh, phenomena, I would like to uh, point out the appropriation of truthfulness, which I don't like as a name, but I will go for it now. So the idea, what I want to say is that uh, below you can see a video uh, which was taken by um, civilians, by people uh, on the spot. And uh, above you can see a video which was made by a news agency, the Radio Free Europe. And it, uh, the video above is uh, trying to appropriate some of the visual uh, style of the video uh, below. So it uh, has, um, uh, has the, the held hand camera uh, that is moving freely through space, but uh, in front of it, uh, there is a reporter. I don't know why doesn't it want to replay. Here it is, but in front of it is a reporter, which kind of uh, brings it uh, closer to the old news media video where a reporter is in front of a standing camera talking about something which is happening behind his back. Here, reporter is more engaged. So the news agency is actually uh, uh, purposefully employing this uh, 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 camera, handheld camera visuals in order to be uh, more truthful, so to say, not to look like uh, CNN uh, from Iraq, but to look like the do-it-yourself uh, civilian videos. Um, and what it all comes down to, and why am I all, why am I pointing out this all of these phenomena, is that this war, like uh, many other wars, uh, has uh, become or was uh, an image war. Uh, but uh, this image is not just uh, uh, an image uh, like um, it was uh, in the. Sorry for touching my mic. Uh, uh, like in the old days of the Gulf War or the Iraqi War, it is, and that's why I call it the hashtag war, because uh, this image is not a solitary image of a television screen where everything comes from the same source, because this image became very biased over the course of the last uh, uh, 50 years. But uh, it is a hashtag war because this image needs to be copied and reposted uh, many times so that it creates and it does create this uh, polyvocal sense of uh, unity of um, a lot of people being together on the same thing, thinking the same thing. And in this way, it serves to validate uh, our values. And that's why I wanted you to remember the like us uh, activist from uh, Syria, uh, because Ukrainians are even more like us than Syrian, much more. And it's not just because of, uh, I, I believe, of course, I don't have any proof that like the whole outburst of empathy, both digital and real life empathy with people helping uh, Ukrainians uh, all over Europe, especially in the bordering Hungary, uh, countries like Hungary, where I'm currently living, uh, but uh, that um, this comes uh, not just from the fact that they are white and not uh, dark skinned like uh, the popular opinion uh, was, but uh, because they are more approximately uh, similar to us and yet not like us. When I say us, I don't mean Serbians, but uh, the Western uh, 
uh, culture in the sense that they want to the, what they want to be is to become a part of European Union to become a part of NATO and they are fighting a war against much uh, much much uh, stronger enemy in order to be able to do this in this Maria, way they are Maria, excuse uh -huh. me we need to move into the panel discussion so okay can yeah. I wrap it up wrap it up yes yes just quickly like one minute uh, less half a minute <laughs> half a minute okay so in this sense that's how it um, uh, and so okay one minute this is the uh, this should be but it doesn't play uh-huh this is the gallery of images that i took from the hashtag i stand with ukraine from uh, the instagram uh, my whole point is that when you cry for empathy on digital terms in a digital world what you will get is mostly uh, digital empathy where I is in the focus. So you can see uh, everything uh, from merchandise, advertisement to actual information, memes, all come down to the same hashtag, to the same label, uh, and have the same value, so to say, in the digital uh, realm. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Sorry if I was too long. <laughs> Don't worry. So we need now to move into the um, into the panel. What I am unsure is if there is a different link for that. So maybe Pedra can. Yesterday there was. Yeah. So then let's move, let's move everyone to the to the panel to the link for the panel. 